This video will contain details about the endings of both Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2, as well as lightly touch on plot elements from Xenogears. You have been warned, go play these games before you watch this video, it'll make the experience all the more magical, and it is totally worth it. Anyway, onto the video. So Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is now an official thing that is happening and it's coming this September. Not only that, but true to the rumors we heard about this game last year, it's set in the aftermath of the first two games' narratives. The game's announcement trailer has a lot to tell us about how this came to be and how it will all play out. But before we jump into a full-on analysis, let's get the basics down. A vast world awaits in Xenoblade Chronicles 3, the next in the acclaimed RPG series from developer Monolith Soft. Players will step into the roles of protagonists Noah and Mio amid the turmoil between the hostile nations of Kevis and Agnos. Six characters hailing from those nations will take part in a grand tale with life as its central theme. Explore a new world that will connect the futures of both Xenoblade Chronicles and Xenoblade Chronicles 2. So we have our premise, two nations locked in war. Our main cast, consisting of Noah and Mio as lead protagonist, as well as Lanz, Yuni, Tyon, and Senna. Our central theme of the story, life, and confirmation that we aren't just seeing things, this is a world that will connect the futures of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2. This is even represented in the game's key visual at the end of the trailer. It was confirmed in an interview released shortly after the trailer with executive director Mr. Tetsuya Takahashi that instead of one gigantic titan welcoming us into this adventure in the key art, we see the remains of two, the Makana Sword and the split in half body of the Urian Titan, both being the respective looming titans featured on the previous game's key art. In this same interview, Takahashi also explains that this visual was not a new idea for the team, but something that's been a long time in the making. Sitting sometime between the end of Xenoblade Chronicles 1's development and the start of 2's as its origin point, implying the entirety of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 might have been developed with the next entry's direction already in mind. He goes on to express that the team is using everything they've learned from past entries in the series to make this game the best it can be, and that they believe despite the many ties to past games shown so far, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 will be enjoyable to both those who have played past entries in the series and those who have not. Alright, now that we've gotten a good handle on what this world is, and Monolith Soft's ambitions for it, I think it's about time we start looking at this trailer. The trailer starts with Noah playing a melody on his flute. I can only imagine this will be the main theme of the game since it returns when the title is shown later. Noah is described as a soldier of Kevis, one of the game's two warring nations, and as an offseer who mourns for soldiers lost on the battlefield. His flute seems to be connected to his duty as an offseer, and his name is likely a reference to the biblical figure Noah, who is known for building an ark after being chosen as the leader of the sole survivors of a great flood used to cleanse the world. An interesting parallel considering Noah will emerge as our protagonist in this newly created and cleansed world. As a side note, it has been confirmed that Xenoblade Chronicles 2 character designer Matsusuku Saito will return as designer of the protagonists in 3. The area Noah is in is a rocky terrain with no real distinguishable features, but the background does have a skyline covered with what looks like a graded pattern similar to the Makana's face from Xenoblade Chronicles 1. We then get a close-up on Noah and our first voiceover of the trailer begins. Interesting since English dubbing is already available. It could be signaling that Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is pretty far along and likely pretty close to completion. We'll assume this voice is Noah, but it's impossible to say for sure. The scene fades into a battlefield full of soldiers in black, which according to Nintendo is a sign of Kevis forces. The soldiers' uniforms look very similar in style to the Bionis Defense Force uniforms from Xenoblade Chronicles 1, but they carry both blasters and energy swords that look similar to blade weapons from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. We then see machinery roll by with the same blue energy powering it as seen on the soldiers' energy swords. Mechanical technology is another staple of Kevis forces, according to Nintendo. The machine's designs look strikingly similar to Mechon, which becomes even more recognizable as we pan up to a massive war machine with Mechon parts and even a face. While this happens, Noah continues his voiceover stating, Fighting in order to live and living to fight. That's the way of our world, Ionios. 
revealing the world's new name. This whole scene has a striking resemblance to the opening of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 at Sword Valley. While not shown in the reveal trailer, screenshots from Nintendo's official website do reveal the second nation Agnus and their forces on the other side of the battlefield. Whereas Kevitz is a nation built on mechanical technology, Agnos relies on weapons of ether, now described as magical technology. Their autonomous machines are very similar in design to the artifices of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, while their soldiers sport a brand new design with white armor and fully covered horned helmets with similar energy swords and blasters to Kevis. However, they are now powered by gold light. Now if you haven't noticed yet, there is a strange familiarity to the weapons these two forces use, because these nations are literally bringing to life a war between the concepts of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2. Kevis uses Mechon machinery powered by a blue energy reminiscent of the Light of the Monado, and Agnos uses artifices with gold light energy that matches that of the Aegis Mithra. Moving on though, we see Noah in a battle for the first time as he flips out of the way while Mio throws one of her twin rings at him. The grass on fire in the background seems to imply this is on a battlefield. Noah still wears his more regal clothing, suggesting he is still a soldier at this point. This goes for other characters from this scene in the trailer as well, who all wear different clothing than shown in their official art. Maybe this suggests that fashion clothing will return in Xenoblade Chronicles 3? The art style seems to lean more towards one, so it is a possibility, but it's more likely this particular case is due to taking place earlier on in the story. We also get our first look at Noah's sword here, which can be seen more clearly in his character art. Sporting a red coating with blue energy emitting from it similar to the Monado, and gold color accents similar to the Aegis, the blade seems to be a merging of the two designs. The sword is even double-edged, lending further credence to the fact that it is a fusion of the two designs. Noah's voiceover now questions Mio on why she would side with them, most likely referring to the second nation in this war, which Mio hails from, Agnus. Mio is the Agnus counterpart to Noah, being a soldier and offseer just as he is. And for those of you that have played Xenoblade Chronicles 2, she is immediately recognizable in her similarities to one of that game's main characters, Mia. Her hair color and style, the same golden eyes, Gormati ears, the use of twin rings as weapons, and even the core crystal on her chest that directly mirrors the color and size of Nia's from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I don't think that Mio is a Nia in disguise though, for reasons we'll get into later. Instead, I believe Mio is likely Nia's daughter. As Mio spins around to face up to Noah again, we also catch our first glimpse of another important character behind her, Senna. Her weapon is instantly recognizable for its similarities to the Shield Hammer weapon class in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Along with this, the appearance of a blue stone-like object on her chest and what looks like energy lines running down her body suggest that she is a blade, a race first seen in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. On her hammer is the first example of a gem we will see on many party members' weapons, and even seems to shift into an energy bar of sorts during combat. Remember this for quite a bit later. Mio continues to clash with Noah until she slashes him across the face, drawing what seems to be a very darkly colored blood. We then cut to a different scene in the same location where our next character is revealed. Lanz is a childhood friend of Noah who wields a great sword that doubles as a shield. From a design standpoint, he seems to draw inspiration from both Zeke and Ryan. When first seeing Lanz, his skin complexion led me to believe he might be Urian, making for an interesting turncoat dynamic with a character from a race in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 fighting alongside Kevis, a Xenoblade Chronicles 1 nation. However, on closer inspection, I believe Lance is more likely an evolved form of the Machina from Xenoblade Chronicles 1. The Machina of the first game had much more mechanical bodies, making Lance's design quite an evolution, but still showing distinct features of the race, such as the circuit-like lines running down his face and arms, and what looks to be fully robotic hands. This could place Lance as a half-Machina, half-Homs character, possibly even making him a descendant of characters like Venea or the Nada. A perplexing detail of him, though, is the pattern we see on the bottom of his chin. At first, it appears to be a nice chin tattoo or marking to diversify his design, but then that same pattern appears on the three in the logo of Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Is it a coincidence or an important pattern? I have no idea. Anyway, as Lanz rushes into battle to save Noah from an incoming blow dealt by Senna, we get a better look at how his weapon functions as a shield. It seems to be powered by the same blue energy of other Kev's forces, and the way it folds into a shield is very similar to Shulk's replica Monados. However, the barrier it puts out seems to resemble blade barriers from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Lance's presumed voice over here does bring up a few more questions though, as he states, I refuse to believe you are him in an aggressive tone. I refuse to believe you are him. Which of the male characters we know of so far, that statement can only really apply to Noah or Tyon, who we'll discuss a bit later. 
because another more likely option for who Lance is talking to in this voice clip appears in the next scene. Here, we see a man removing his mask to show a very familiar, yet different face. Meanwhile, this reveal is accompanied by the very distinct voice of Simon Thorpe, who played Van Damme in Xenoblade 2. From the exact hairdo to the cross scar across his face, we could be looking at this game's interpretation of Van Damme, since every Xenoblade Chronicles game so far has found a way to work in a character with that name. Where things get interesting, is how this character could have come to be. In a post-battle conversation in Xenoblade 2, Van Damme reveals that he did have a son, but seems to imply that his son may have passed away. Ah, oh, that little shrimp reminds me of my boy. I'm alright. Honest. This is left ambiguous, so theoretically this man could just be a descendant of Van Damme. But I believe the more likely answer is that this man is Rex's son. Now, he could be a son or a great-grandson since we aren't exactly sure how far in the future this game is set, but I'm inclined to believe it's likely been at least a good 100 years for the state of the world to have changed in so many drastic ways. So I think this conclusion on Van Damme's identity makes the most sense based on what we currently know. Rex adored Van Damme, and I find it very likely that if he had a son, he might name him after his old mentor. Next is this man's hair and skin color, which unlike Van Damme who was Urian, places him as a human with the same shade of hair as Rex. His jacket, well, I could just see it being a combat vest, does remind me a little bit of Rex's salvaging gear. And finally, in his voiceover, he says, You are, you're not enemies now. Which sounds just like something Rex would say to try and calm tensions, and is very in character for him acting as a mediator in a war. Even back to Lance's comment, I refuse to believe you are him. I could see Lance saying this to Van Damme because this man is a descendant of the legendary hero of Agnes, Rex, who would be well known by all the people of Ionios. Until we learn the real truth behind this character, he remains one of this trailer's most intriguing mysteries. Next, we see some performers, most likely offseers, paying their respects to the Fallen as Kevis soldiers watch from the crowd. There's even a sparkling energy erupting into the air around them, potentially the souls of the departed being lifted by the songs of performing offseers. Remember, the central theme of Xenoblade Chronicles 3 was cited as life, and since death is the direct counterpart to that, I believe it will also play a significant role in the game with many characters dying, and Noah and Mio's status as Opsir helping to explore that. This performance then shows a close-up of the middle performer. We don't know if this character has any particular significance, but they, like other performers, are wearing the same regal clothing as Noah earlier in the trailer. Also, they have blonde hair, so hey, maybe they're related to Shulk. We then see Noah and Mio in their main outfits for the first time in the trailer, playing their offseer flutes together in the rain. Noah is now playing a white flute and Mio a black, implying they traded flutes. This is when we start to hear some fascinating voice lines over them, though I want to save going over those for later. Cutting to a sunset shot of them without their jackets emphasizes the difference between Agnes and Kevis, with their black and white clothing. The location in the background bears a solid resemblance to Gormont from Xenoblade Chronicles 2, and if you take a look at the skyline, you can see what is either the outline of some tree's leaves, the silhouette of a floating island, or the titan of Moirardain from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. To be perfectly honest, at a time, I could see all three. And I think I kinda lost my mind a little bit while writing this part, so I took a break. <laughs> Next, we're introduced to two more characters, Uni and Tyon. Let's look at Uni first, a member of the Kevis forces who happens to be the first High Entia we've seen so far in Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Her shorter wings tell us she is a half-breed like Melia from Xenoblade Chronicles 1, but the Melia similarities don't end there, since her character art shows her wielding a staff with a similar wing design to Melia's, the same shade of blue eyes, and a lighter hair shade that while not an exact match, could be drawn as a similarity. So if it wasn't obvious yet, yes, I'm implying that Uni might be Melia's daughter. While it's not as sure of a connection as Mio to Nia, Yuni's connections to Kevis, her character design, and even the narrative parallels that her character could draw to Mio, leads me to believe this might be the case. A few more notes on Yuni before we move on. She is a childhood friend of both Lanz and Noah, who carries a sharp tongue and a rough personality, remind you of anyone, and she specializes in healing allies. Though if you look at her character art and pay close attention later on in the trailer, you can also see that her staff doubles as an energy cannon. Also, it carries the same mysterious gem we saw in other characters' weapons already. One final detail about her design I wanted to bring to your attention is her belt. 
since it looks like it takes direct inspiration from Shulk's belt worn throughout his appearance in Xenoblade Chronicles Future Connected. Also, I wanted to mention that this circular glowing symbol can be seen on basically anything, Kevis. We see it all over the foot soldiers, the machines, Lance's gear, even the back of Noah. If you take a quick look at this screenshot here, you can see that he has a shoulder sling with this same metal plate on the back as well. I don't think this detail is of much importance, it's just a way of showing, hey, Shulk influenced the way that Kevis went on to develop their technology. Next up is Tyon, an Agnes tactician who fights alongside Mio using his smarts and insight. One of Tyon's defining features is his choice of weapon, origami birds seemingly controlled by a wrist gauntlet he wears. This special weapon and his status as a fellow Agnes protagonist leads me to believe that like Senna and Mio, he too is likely a blade. His design brings to mind past characters in the series such as Akos in Xenoblade 2 or HB in Xenoblade Chronicles X, making me wonder if he too might have a snarky know-it-all attitude. These characters are introduced in another scene from the same battlefield we saw earlier, pinning them in a fight against each other. Again, neither Yuni nor Tyon are wearing the same outfits shown in their character art at this point in the trailer. Yuni dodges behind a rock while saying, how can our lives mean so snuffing little to you? Meanwhile, Tyon prepares to send his origami birds after her, responding, they're not your friends anymore, they're his fuel. Which is one of the many lines in this trailer of great importance to unlocking the secret, of this game's plot. The concept of friends becoming fuel is certainly not a new one to Xenoblade Chronicles, since Mechon generated fuel by devouring organic life in Xenoblade Chronicles 1, and in a similar way, blades from Xenoblade Chronicles 2 were used by humans such as Amalthus for little more than their power. In this analysis, I will not be going over every little detail and every little thought that comes into my head when it comes to lines of dialogue like this that seem to lead us on, since quite frankly, I don't want to spoil this game too much for myself ahead of time. But let it be known that there are many theories from lines like this already floating around, and I will be talking about some of mine at the end of this analysis. This is when we get into the breathtaking landscapes part of the trailer and... Hoo boy! A lot of these have a vague familiarity about them. First up is this field Noah runs through with rocky terrain on either side of him, a waterfall ahead, with a rainbow included. Can't have a rainbow with that rhyme. Spiky cliffs above, and a hill that almost looks like our plains off in the distance. This is probably one of the hardest areas to pin to an existing location, but if I were to, I'd say it looks pretty similar to the landscapes of the Bionis around Colony 9 and the Gower Plains area. The next shot is an astonishing sight, showing the scale of the areas we'll be exploring in Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Taking a closer look at the background details, though, has me wondering if this is the landmass created when all of Xenoblade Chronicles 2's titans converged to create one continent at the end of that game. If you look at the scenery closely, you can see what seems to be the same gaping open mouth of the Orion Titan we can see later in the game's key art. And to the left of that rolling green field similar to Gormont, to the right, ice spikes reminding me of Tantal, and in the foreground, weathered terrain with a rusty metal walkway Noah walks across, not too dissimilar from more Ardain. Also, if we wait until just the end of this scene, we can see our first look at this game's version of the item orb, which is now a nice shade of purple instead of the usual blue color spot. Next up is our best look at the remains of the Makana sword, as it stands upright in the background as Noah walks across the terrain, sporting a similar shade of grass to Erasi. All this while a voiceover from our new Van Damme character says, sword. Sword March, the man pierced by a great sword. Now, I love Simon Thorpe's Van Damme accent to death, but I'm willing to admit, I can't really tell what the first word he says here is supposed to be. Sword Mat, Sword Mot, Sword Mark, my friend Chase suggested Doormat. Hey everybody, hi, I am coming to you now a bit further down the line, knowing that Nintendo has added official English subtitles to this trailer so we can tell exactly what every character is saying, and I was surprised by how well I interpreted mostly everything except this line. I was a little bit off. What this Van Damme character is actually saying is Sword March. That is the location he is referring to. It is capitalized, so it is just the location. It is not Doormat, unfortunately. He's likely referring to an area related to the Makana's sword, since that is this world's greatest sword. This sword mark could be a new name given to the Orion Titan, which likely received the giant cut down its side by the Makana sword, or he could be saying Swordmot, which seems to be a combination of the words sword and Gormont. If this area from the wide shot is Gormont, as I theorized earlier, that would vaguely line up with the position where the Makana sword should pierce the ground in order to create the landscape we see on the other side of the Titan 
at the end of the trailer. And speaking of the Makanis, in the next shot we see a desert valley, which seeing as it holds a structure very similar to one of the Makanis digits, is likely the fallen arm. In the foreground, it shows us Mia as the player's active character for the first time, a new type of tree lighting the landscape, and some more item orbs over to the right side of the screen. This is also a good opportunity since we are about to see a lot of different characters running around to say that characters no longer carry their weapons on their backs, which I just found a little odd. This is followed by another short look at Lance walking towards another one of Kevis's faced machines, this time featuring giant claws. This is likely some kind of excavation machine developed with help from the Machina to do some kind of digging here, though as we will soon see, it also has a lethal side as well. It's been deployed on a rocky terrain with an icy mountain looming in the background. Could this be Tantal or Valak Mountain? Based on how many other locations we've seen so far that seem to be new versions of old locales, it seems likely. Following this is our first look at what seems to be a Kevis settlement, with all its mechanical parts and use of black. It's hard to discern just what kind of settlement this is, but the less lavish and more mechanical feel to it leads me to believe this is some sort of factory or military base. Also, now the player is using Senna, which is surprising since this is a Kevis settlement. This shot gives us a good look at Uni heading towards an Agnes behemoth that almost looks like an armored titan similar to the ones found on Temperantia. However, it seems to be fully mechanical using light energy to move its leg appendages. Another quick button here with some future information. So after the script of this video was recorded, Monolith Soft continued to just announce some new information on their Twitter account, mostly on the Japanese side, and then Nintendo of America and Europe would sometimes localize it. This particular message, I can't find a localization of for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why, they just didn't want us to know. But uh, a fan translation here has very graciously come to the rescue to tell us a little bit more about these giant machines here. So we've seen some already, we're talking about the one in Magna Forest right now, we'll see more later, but apparently these things are called Iron Giants. Little bit confusing there, but yeah. The post goes on to say that there are dozens of these mechanical beasts throughout Kevis and Agnes. As they point out with this image in particular, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, but I did not recognize this as an iron giant, I just thought it was like a very big colony, which it is, that's what they're saying it is, but it's also apparently an iron giant, so that is, that is interesting. We also see another set of item orbs to the side of Uni, but the really interesting detail here comes from the background. This is Machna Falls, one of the most memorable locations of Xenoblade Chronicles 1. Next, it's Tyon's time to shine as a playable character, as we see him walking towards what seems to be a large Agna settlement. We can deduce this thanks to the streetlights and sign out front. The surrounding terrain and fog make this area closely resemble Satoru Marsh or Temperantia. We then switch back to Mio in the lead as she rail grinds past some floating spires, which this could be a stretch, but what if those were the remains of Morardane? as the rest of the titan crumpled and decayed, leaving only these floating spires behind. Meanwhile, as Mio continues down her track, what looks to be a giant floating structure of Kevis' origin is revealed along the left side of the screen. Could this be a redesigned and fortified Alchemoth? As we'll soon see, the Kevis leadership seems to have direct ties to the Hyentia. And to the left side past the Kevis structure, you can see what seems to be a more substantial landmass that could easily be the Bionis shoulder. We then see multiple characters traversing the world for the first time. We have Noah in the lead, followed by Lance and Senna, and Mio following behind. This brings up the possibility of party limits now consisting of four characters. In Xenoblade Chronicles 1, players are never allowed to have more than three characters in their party at a time. In Xenoblade Chronicles 2, this was technically surpassed with six party members being the default. However, this was due to three of those characters playing support roles as Blades. This the trailer shows little evidence of Blades functioning in the same support roles they did in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. So wow, this party of four is split up between two human characters and two Blade characters, I believe it's more likely that the Blades function on their own as playable characters, similar to their depictions in the Xenoblade Chronicles 2 DLC, Torn of the Golden Country. This in turn means that our active party limit has been increased to at least four characters, and could in turn hint at Xenoblade Chronicles 3 sporting an even bigger main cast than the six playable characters that have already been revealed. It just would wouldn't be a Xenoblade game without at least one hidden party member. Anyway, back to this image. This looks to be taking place in Machna Forest, but there's not really a lot going on in the background here outside of some shrubbery, trees, and item orb, and what looks to be a jungle quad wing lurking in the background. Before we move on though, our new Van Dam has more to say. It's the only way you're gonna defeat the real enemy. Now, in case you don't remember, Van Dam's last line went a little something like, <clears throat> Sword Mart. Land peace by great sword. 
Herbie Derby Do, I'm Van Damme. I, however, think this just might be some clever trailer editing to throw us off the trail of this real enemy business. Who is this real enemy? Well, that's hard to say right now, but we'll briefly touch on a few theories as we near the end of the trailer. These next few scenes look to be a merger of the Lotherian Archipelago from Xenoblade 2 and Eris Sea from Xenoblade 1. While the terrain of this shot looks strictly Lotherian, there are some trees to the right reminding me an awful lot of Eris Sea. But enough about trees because a new gigantic monster sits in the middle of the screen and what looks to be some returning flying enemies whose names I can't remember, so for the sake of time, let's just go with calling them Bobs. It's the next shot though that really brings home this Eris Sea connection with the design of the terrain in the background and the Hyentia structures in the center rock face. We also get our first look at diving here. It's impossible to say the reason for this mechanic at the moment beyond it just looking cool, but it could be a way of increasing your swimming speed, which with an ocean this vast, looks like it might come in handy. Oh, and there's a giant seahorse monster being ridden by an Igna, which is the best new monster design in this trailer in my humble opinion. The final of this string of scenes is what really shows the connection between the last two though. Since here you can see one of the Lotherian Titans, and here you can see a spiked rock structure similar to the back plates of the Bionis. Also, for the first time in the series outside of Scales in Xenoblade Chronicles X, yes, that's right, X, even if Nintendo and Monolith Soft forget you, I never will, we see pilotable vehicles. This ship seems to be directly controlled by the player as it swivels by this new Gariados monster. And while this is really cool, it mostly just gives me hope that this game will allow us to pilot even more cool vehicles throughout the rest of it. Next, we get another look at the same Kevis machine we saw Lance walking in front of earlier, except this time it's standing upright and looking a little less like a giant excavation machine and a little more like a weapon of mass destruction. It charges up a purple energy beam similar to the beams Metal Face could fire in Xenoblade 1 before firing it down at an unseen target. One of the following shots in the trailer shows both Uni and Tyon in the same desert terrain doing what seems to be a team-up maneuver, which could be taken as a direct continuation of this shot with the Kevis machine actually firing on them. We can even see remnants of what looks like the same purple energy in the air. Also, the fact that Uni and Tyon are working together here, in case it wasn't obvious, does confirm that in some point in the story, our Kevs and Agnos protagonist will set aside their differences and work together. One final desert scene leaves some puzzling questions for us. Who the heck are these Nop on? Why did the trailer take so long to show them to us? And why do they resemble Rex and Pyra? Before we get to these Nop on though, let's address some background details. Behind them looks to show a transition from a rocky desert to a snowy terrain, matching this location with our first look at the giant Kev's machine earlier. But if you look very closely at the scenery, you can also see remnants of the same purple energy we saw with Uni and Tyon. So that seems to link all of these scenes as happening very close together. But now for the elephant in the room. Why they look like that? My best explanation for the similarities between these Nopon and Rex and Pyra of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is option A, they are Nopon cosplayers, option B, their design similarities are a total coincidence, or option C, these are actually Rex's kids. And yes, that last one was a joke in case I have to clarify. Also, it is interesting to note that of the six playable characters we have confirmed so far, none of them are Nopon. Could this be a break from the series tradition like Xenoblade Chronicles X? Or could there be a Nopon or two still waiting in the wings to join this party? Fitting enough, these Nopon do carry weapons of their own, with the female Nopon holding a shield similar to the one Poppy Alpha uses in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, and the male Nopon holding what I can only assume to be a chainsaw. We then get our final look at the battle scene that first introduced us to this cast of characters. Mio runs forward dodging energy blast shot by Yuni. With the assistance of Tyon's origami bird, she does a flip into the air, giving us our best look at the area this battle takes place in yet. As she lands, we get a peek at all three Kevis party members fighting side by side, as well as just how Yuni shot energy blasts at Mio, by flipping her staff sideways to turn it into an energy cannon. This next shot shows us a close-up on Yuni, with Noah, Mio, and what looks to be Tyon, and what I assume is the same Kevis settlement we saw Senna in earlier. This is where the next batch of dialogue of interest appears. Uni says, what good is filling up these flickering clocks in our eyes? It will never replace the friends we've lost. This is one of the trailer's best theory bait lines. It introduces this concept of clocks, which we'll hear Mio repeat over again in the very next scene of the trailer. But just what are these clocks, and how do they correlate to the friends we've lost? I want you to hold on to that thought going into the next scene. Next, we see the return of Magna Forest, this time in a cutscene with Noah and Mio. The perspective of Magna Falls in the background implies this scene is taking place on top of the behemoth we saw in the scene with Uni. 
Two light beams spew out on both sides of Mio and Noah as they stand in a back-to-back -back formation. The scene then shifts to show them from a front perspective. We can see a spiked object in the sky above that almost reminds me of the head of the Bionis. They then both dodge a light beam shot straight at them, but not before Mio says, Flame clock! It has to go! just keeps on living through it all. It's a never-ending cycle, an eternal history. A grand tale with life as its central theme. Whatever these clocks really are, my theory is that they are vital to Xenoblade Chronicles 3's plot and will be a crucial aspect of how this game explores what it means to be alive. If you want a little less general theory, my current one is this. In a world that has no almighty power, no conduit, no trinity processor left to monitor its situation, drawing energy from the dead's life force has become one of the world's greatest sources of power. The clocks are the central control units and power sources of the nation's largest and smallest weapons of destruction. Kevis and Agnos' war exploits that power, forcing the dead to lend their strength to a war they died in from beyond the grave. Not as soldiers, but as a power source. Fighting in order to live, living in order to fight, and dying to fuel the fight. This brings us to two final scenes. Both of masked rulers who try as they might, can't hide their true identities from us. These characters are heavily implied by both their voice acting and designs to be Melia and Nia, from Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2. Now, seeing as we know the nations of Kevis and Agnus are themed around elements of one of the two preceding games in the trilogy, as well as the attire, seniority, and manner in which these characters are presented, makes it easy to jump to the conclusion that these ladies are the leaders of these warring nations. An interesting choice of rival leaders for sure, as these characters actually share many similarities. Being part of a species with a cycle of rebirth forced upon them, an unrequited love for the protagonist of their games, and even even an above-average lifespan potentially allowing them to outlive their past companions. Hyentia have been said to live around 300 to 400 years, and flesh eaters such as Nia seem to be able to reach ages of at least 500 years old. This puts our potential time setting as anywhere between the birth of this new world and 300 to 400 years in the future. Now let's focus on these two individually, starting with Melia. Before she is revealed to the camera, we see a Kevis guard. While we can't see whether or not this guard has wings on his head to confirm this, I believe this guard is more than likely Hyentia due to the beak-shaped visor and heavy armor. The use of regal colors for their gold and red armor, with a black cape trailing behind, leaves me to believe they are likely a royal guard assigned to protect the Empress of Kevis, Lady Melia. Melia sports a brand new look that is simultaneously familiar yet different. First, she has abandoned the white dress of the Hyentia to now embrace a Kevis black dress. On her head, we can see half-breed Hyentia wings as well as her trademark white hair and curls. However, she now has grown the back of her hair out past her neck. She also has retreated back to wearing a mask, as she first did as a Hyentia princess in Xenoblade Chronicles 1. What Melia says as the camera zooms in on her, though, might just be the biggest tease in a trailer full of hints. Ouroboros abhor this world. For those of you that don't know, Ouroboros, a circular symbol that depicts a snake or dragon devouring its own tail and that is used especially to represent the eternal cycle of destruction and rebirth. It's a fitting symbol to reference in a game connecting two prominent races created for cycles of endless destruction and rebirth now living in a world created for the very purpose of escaping such predetermined cycles. Throughout this trailer, we've even seen signs that this cycle of destruction and rebirth has somehow rerooted itself in Ionios. A main theme of life, an endless war powered by machines that process the souls of the dead into more energy, and something I have teased but not yet gone over, the war machines and weapons our main characters wield seem to be powered by stones depicting an Ouroboros. In scenes where characters are fighting, those stones are even replaced with circular energy bars, implying that even the weapons we use 
are powered by this game's new Ouroboros. War. But when Melia says, Ouroboros abhor this world, the big question is, who is the Ouroboros Melia refers to? Because as a leader of one of the two nations locked in this war, I doubt she herself has noticed or even cares about the cycle her war against Agnes has created. It could be both herself and the Blades of Agnes, or is she only referring to Agnes Blades whose cycle of rebirth persists in this new world, unlike the Hyentia? Or is she referring to something neither Kevis or Agnes in origin? Abor is a strong word one of the most potent words for displaying hatred in the English language. While it's very possible Melia could see her opponents on the other side of this war, those who lay claim to the world Shulk and Alvis created, as the Ouroboros that abhors this world, there is also the possibility that the Ouroboros Melia is referring to could be the same real enemy Van Damme teased earlier in the trailer. It's no secret by now that Xenoblade Chronicles games often have quite a few antagonists up their sleeves, and the first one introduced to you is almost never the true villain of the game. There is most certainly a force lurking in the shadows of Xenoblade Chronicles 3, and here are some potential hints we have about who that force might be. Xenoblade Chronicles Future Connected introduces us to a new antagonist with the Fog Beast and Fog King, creatures appearing from another dimension through rifts in the sky. Though these creatures served as the side story's main antagonist, the player still knows surprisingly little about these beasts by the time the story wraps up. So could Xenoblade Chronicles 3 further explore just what the Fog Beasts are? Could they be this game's secret threat? A wholly new threat for a wholly new world. Sounds ominous. Are my fears unfounded? To be fair, there's a lot about this world that's different. Frankly, it's anyone's guess right now. Hmm. Does it bother you? The rift, I mean. I have an ill premonition. Oh? Disaster. Complete ruin. Inescapably looming over our future. I know not why. But that is the vague dread that I feel when I consider the rift. Now, this next possibility I am woefully underqualified to talk about, but seeing as just how many connections between this game and Xenoblade Chronicles 3 has already been found, I couldn't complete this analysis without at least mentioning. Xenogears. For those unaware, Xenogears is considered the first in the wider Xeno series, which Xenoblade Chronicles was born from. It's a PlayStation 1 RPG with an original story developed by Monolith Soft founder and creative lead Tetsuya Takahashi, and was even pitched initially as a storyline for Final Fantasy VII. Anyway, Xenogears is really what started it all for Monolith Soft. Without that game, the company would have never been founded out of X Square employees, and all of these games wouldn't exist. As mentioned earlier, due to not having played Xenogears before, I feel very underqualified to compare all the elements of its plot to that of Xenoblade Chronicles 3, but I still can't ignore some of the blatant callbacks to this game that are starting to add up. First, let's start off easy. Noah's design, which while nothing mind-blowing does seem to take inspiration from Faze. Then there is the matter of Xenogears' production name, Project Noah. Where things really start to take an interesting turn, though, is with the names of the nations Agnus and Kevis. These names aren't without their symbolism. Agnus is Latin for lamb, and Kevis is Hebrew for sheep. Now this naming could just be another biblical reference, with Kevis and Agnus being sacrificial lambs for this world being manipulated by some higher power. That's a pretty standard Xenoblade plot right there. But a second reason for this name could be because of Xenogears. In Xenogears, a similar situation to the one Ionios finds itself in is unfolding, with a war being fought between the nations of Ave and Kishlev. In Xenogears, however, a third nation is revealed to be pulling the strings behind this war, a kingdom in the sky known as Solares, a kingdom that refers to the people of those two nations fighting below by a derogatory term, Lamb. If those connections weren't enough to get you feeling fishy yet, allow me to share just one more comparison. We've already talked extensively about how Melia's line, Aurora Boris Abor This World, could be interpreted within what this trailer shows us of Ionios. But this word also shares a significant connection to Xenogears, as the name of its final boss. For the sake of spoilers for both you and myself, I will not be exploring that topic anymore, but I just thought you might want to know. 
The Xenogears parallels are out in full force in this trailer, and while I don't personally believe this game will be following directly in its footsteps as a sort of spiritual remake, as many others have suggested, it would also not be a surprise to me if some of the final game story does draw an eerily similar line. Anyway, with Melia's Oso oh teasery line and all that follows it out of the way, that leads us to Nia. Nia appears in a wide shot of what looks to be her standing on a grand throne. Four of the spires that strut out of the throne emit a blue light similar to the color of core crystals. As we zoom in to get a closer look at Nia, we can instantly identify that yes, this is her, by her one-of-a-kind blue and red core crystal adorning her chest. The same exact design of Mia's core crystal as was pointed out much earlier. Like the soldiers of Agnes, Nia too seems to be embracing Eastern influences in her clothing. Wearing a white, gold, and red dress similar to her original blade outfit, as well as embracing the colors of Agnes. Nia now leans even further into embracing a kitsune look. She adorns a mask now, just as Melia, to hide her face, and gives us the final line of dialogue this trailer has to offer. They must be erased without a trace. Again, this could mean anyone, but just as with Melia's Ouroboros jab, my best guess is that the two leaders are referencing each other here. A key difference between Melia and Nia that I find interesting is that it's easy to imagine Melia growing into the role of a ruler, especially after her coronation at the end of Future Connected. But Nia never really struck me as the leader type. I believe the story of how she came to power and just what happened to turn such optimistic endings into such a desolate, war-torn future will be one of this game's most interesting plot threads to explore. A lot of hate seems to be brewing between these two nations, and exactly why isn't clear. Could these nations be fighting due to their different relationships with Klaus? With the people of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 wanting to live in a world where they can forge their own path through the future and join the life they've been given, and with the people of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 coming to accept that life just continues in never-ending circles for them, but that doesn't negate the bonds of the past, it just allows them to move forward and make the most of every life. It's such a fascinating concept to think about, how one man's split personality leads these people down very different, yet very similar paths. One more thing I want to go over before we tackle the title reveal scene is the topic of returning characters, or more, the overall lack thereof. Despite Xenoblade Chronicles 3 taking place in the aftermath of the first two games, this announcement trailer only directly reveals two returning characters at the very end of the trailer. While this by no means confirms that Melia and Nia are the sole survivors of the last two games found in this one, it poses an interesting question. What did happen to all of the series' other iconic characters? This is especially prevalent with all of the Blade characters from Xenoblade Chronicles 2, who due to their unique life cycles focused on reawakening, could easily reappear in this game no matter how far in the future it is set. Perhaps in this new world, Blades are no longer bound by the same life cycles they are in All Rest, though thanks to Nia's appearance and and the circumstances for why this war seems to be unfolding, I do see that as rather unlikely. So let's say for a moment that yes, all of the blades seen in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 will make appearances in this game. While that will allow players to get some closure on their favorite blades from Xenoblade Chronicles 2, what about the stories of humans and especially Hom characters in this new world? That's where this voiceover from the trailer comes in. You know, I really thought I had something with this one, this theory I'm about to tell you. Um but I don't, because as we mentioned earlier in the video, official captions have come out in English, Nintendo posted them on the announcement YouTube video, and they confirm that the characters talking here are in fact Mio and Noah. Unless these captions are outright lying to us, which I don't think they are, that's going to disprove what I'm about to say here in a minute. But before I do say that, I also want to mention that no, the captions do not give us more information on the actual identity of this new Van Damme looking character, or the final two characters shown in this trailer. So that's unfortunate. What I'm about to say just doesn't apply anymore, but hey. I'm still gonna tell you what I was thinking, just because I think it is still kind of relevant. Fine for you, isn't it? All that time you've got. You could try, try to move forward again. While regularly watching the trailer, these lines may sound pretty unimportant in the scheme of things, just being Mio and Noah talking about time and being able to move forward, but what if I told you this wasn't a conversation between Mio and Noah, but Nia and Rex? The line, you could try, try to move forward again, is what tipped me off to this potential trickery. I can say with almost 99.9% .9 certainty that this line is spoken by Rex's voice actor, Al Weaver. And while Noah's voice actor seems to share a similar voice to Weaver's, I don't believe they are one and the same. Same goes for Mio and Nia. So, 
What does this mean? Well, it could mean that Xenoblade Chronicles 3 will explore how Ionios devolved into the world it is today, and what role the past game's humans and Hom's characters played in that through flashback sequences. Remember, this wouldn't be a new idea for the series, since Xenoblade Chronicles Torn of the Golden Country was originally envisioned as an entire flashback chapter in the story of Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I believe this game is very likely to feature flashback sequences to help tell its story, if not in the form of gameplay sections, at least in cutscenes. Finally, that leads us back to this key visual as the same flute melody from the very beginning of the trailer fades back in, revealing what is most likely the game's main theme. The music for Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is being produced by returning artists and composers such as Yatsunori Mitsuda, Manami Kimura, and Ace. The soundtrack is looking to greatly incorporate a flute-based melody as its motif. And the visuals for this final scene, the already oh-so-iconic key art for this game with a long-forgotten Makana sword and the severed body of the Orion Titan in the background as Mio and Noah look on from a distance. As mentioned earlier, the positioning of the Makana sword and Uriah Titan corpse is rather unclear, but based on the position we see Uriah in in this overworld shot, this scene of Mio and Noah might take place off the mainland of the giant area in this shot. Could this potentially be one of two main continents, home to either Kevis or Agnes? The very last detail I wanted to point out to you all is the logo. We already briefly touched on the strange pattern on the three, but the Xenoblade Chronicles portion of the logo is also hiding an important detail its particle effect. The logo for Xenoblade Chronicles invoked the main blade of that game, the Monado, with its ink streaks, representing the kanji symbols of the Monado's powers. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 continued this trend by replacing ink streaks with flames, a symbol of Pyra, the Aegis, and Xenoblade Chronicles 2's main weapon. Now, not only the logo, but the entire ending sequence of Xenoblade Chronicles 3's trailer includes fading particles, a symbol of this game's main weapon, Noah's sword, and the weapons of Agnes and Kevis, powered by the souls of those who have passed on. And with that, this analysis is complete. Hey everyone, thank you for sticking with me through this very, very long analysis. If you made it this far, I think that's a good indication that you should probably subscribe because you probably enjoyed it, and then you'll get to see more videos like that. So that's just a big win. Big win for me, big win for you. Yeah. It was a lot of fun breaking down this trailer, and I hope you guys learned something new or am excited about a new possibility that I brought to the table in this big breakdown. I am just so excited for this game. September cannot come soon enough. If I missed anything you picked up on, make sure to let me know in the comments below, or if I got anything that you missed out on, let me know that too. <laughs> also, I'm just curious to hear how you guys are feeling about Xenoblade 3. What's the consensus? Are we really feeling it? Do we like the game's attitude? Or is your state of mind over here? Meanwhile, Xenoblade 3 is stuck on a different planet. If you guys enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button. That helps share it around. You can also share it around yourself if you want. You, you feel so inclined. And you could uh, follow me on Twitter, Twitch. What's the other one I do? Discord. We got a, we got a Discord too. <laughs> can you tell I'm a bit rusty on doing outros? Anyway, again, thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you very soon with more new videos. Bye-bye.